All right, we're live. I'm going to hit this real quick. All right. Good morning, everybody. It is Keith Salmon from Keith Salmon Coaching, home of the Million Dollar Story Method. Uh, this is another in the series of the Million Dollar Story series, as I call it. And I'm really honored and privileged to have Gabriel Kazayan on today. She, he is uh, come, joining us from Canada, where he was just telling me that the smoke had finally blown into his, I don't know, is that a valley that you would call it, Gabriel? Yeah, I'm in the mountains, but they're like, I'm in the valley mountain range, um, just north of Idaho. Awesome. Awesome. Just north of, north of Idaho. Okay. I'm in Southern California, and it's it's been pretty bad. It's uh, out, out in the eastern part of the city, Monrovia, Arcadia, Angeles Crest forest there's been a lot of fires and of course um, i was just telling gabriel that my son is up in the portland area and mm. as of yesterday hadn't had to evacuate but near uh, oregon city where that's uh, pretty bad up there but I hope everyone's safe and hope everyone's had a uh, you know listen to the authorities listen to what you're supposed to do and all that stuff so um the million dollar story series is all about people's journeys, people's journeys into business, people's journeys into um, uh, into transformative parts of their life. And uh, uh, my premise is that everybody's got a million dollar story, whether they know it or not. It's about whether they find it, whether they decide what they want to do with it, whether they decide if they want to go into business or, or follow a cause or create um, a, a movement, basically. So um, I came across Gabriel, we're in the same uh, similar group. And he's got a great cause and he's got a great business and he's got a great project. It's called the wholehearted man uh, live on purpose. And uh, we came across each other. We were talking about um, his, he's got a, a book that he's in the middle of writing. So Gabriel, why don't I, I just turn it over to you and tell me a little bit about your project. I call these things projects because they all take such wild forms and, and they're, they're not, uh, nothing's ever straight forward as people think they are. So, Tell me, how, tell me about your journey. Thanks, Keith, and thanks so much for having me on. Um, where to start? I guess I'll start where I am, and that is writing this book. Um, the project as it's shaping up is also a 30-day campaign. Um, I'm on day three or four of that, so I'm just starting. Um, and the campaign is a pre-order, uh, pre-sell book campaign. So um, essentially, uh, it's for first time authors to step into the publishing game. Um, and my agent is a company that um, helps me with launching the campaign. So if I can pre-order and pre-sell 500 books, uh, that's going to attract the attention of different publishing houses. And um, then that agent will help me kind of sell my book and get it um, distributed. So. Yeah, I'm thrilled. It, it was kind of a, a bit of a prayer answered. I was like, well, I know I want to write, but I don't really know how to be bringing my book to the market because there's two two stories underway, right? There's the story I want to tell, and then there's the story of bringing the book into the world. And for that, I knew I wanted a partner and I needed I needed some professional help. So that's what's underway. And yeah, I mean, I can share details if people want to pre-order books at the end of our time here. Sure. No, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. So, you know, the, the, the word book, it kind of insinuates that there's a story behind it. Sometimes it's a, a series of short stories within the book. Sometimes, you know, like you say, there's two stories. It's almost like a Monty Python, the old Monty Python. It's like, well, who's filming us? And then who's filming that documentary crew? It's uh, we have as uh, who all of us who work in the online space, you know, we we have our, our expertise, our area of genius, as they call it. Some people call it the zone of genius. Um, our area of expertise, what what our calling is, uh, whatever it is, um, but then the half of the journey is uh, trying to get that to other people. How do we find the people that are uh, looking for us while we're looking for them? So yeah, the journey um, obviously had to start somewhere. It had to start. You you had to have material for the book. You had to have a, a calling for. Um, what you want to share with the world. So uh, do you mind going into, I mean, the wholehearted man sounds pretty, pretty, um, pretty big. You want to tell us about that a little bit? Sure. So the wholehearted man is 
uh, I'm part of my brand in my coaching. Um, and uh, ultimately, it's just the word that kept coming up when I was really um, sorting out my medicine, essentially, and what I offer. I've been working um, in uh, as a therapist uh, for the last four or five years now. And only in the last year have I started to pivot into the online world and offer coaching um, and really essentially wanting to take what I've learned in my therapy room and make a greater impact with it. Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, shame and shame is a master emotion uh, and it's what keeps people small. And um, uh, the term wholehearted is, is something that stuck with me because it is through loving and the power of love and loving ourselves that we can actually shift those shame patterns. And some of those shame patterns are, are hidden to even to us are there why we stay small or why we get stuck or why at the heart of the question um, is uh, has to do something with unworthiness and where where in my life am I unworthy of fulfilling my purpose of standing in my own um, greatness and so that's the kind of facilitation um, that I'm offering and the transformation that I do with my clients is bring them into that uh, place of fearlessness, love, and, and courage enough to grab onto their purpose. And sometimes maybe it is grabbing onto their purpose that also brings about that motion to um, accept themselves and then stand stand fearlessly in the world and in what they know. And, and so the book is just an, another step in me kind of bringing my work into the world um, and really been a deep service of doing soul work with men um, and inviting them into their power and their purpose. And that's been the focus of, of my work. Right. I like how you talked about the worthiness uh, aspect of it. I think that uh, we have some parallels, even though we're in completely different worlds, but the idea that the worthiness of someone's story uh, seems very small to the person who, who hasn't realized it yet. It's like, oh, nobody wants to know about my story. My story is not a big deal or, you know, sometimes they kind of, they would like to go back to those, you know, darkness areas that dwell in the darkness and don't come, they don't realize that their, their triumph has just become coming into the light basically. And, and that worthiness part is I totally relate to that. And, and, and a lot of my clients have that same thing. That first conversation is, well, nobody would like to hear about my story. Well, I disagree. I disagree wholeheartedly to use one of your words, <laughs> but uh, it's a it's a robust word. That wholehearted thing. It's because it's, it's, it's kind of hearty and, and it's uh, uh, it's all encompassing and it's a it's a great term. I, I really like that term. Um, so in your book, and uh, I think that the you know a lot of people. Uh, who want to be writers, say, for instance, uh, you know, and, and I just want to just preface this. I'm, I'm a writer when I have to be, I'm not a writer of books. I'm a storyteller via the film uh, and advertising world and documentaries and real people conversations. So I take this, I actually kind of do it in the opposite almost. It's like, I take the spoken word and create it into a format that people can uh, digest in a, in a sit down environment, whether it's on video or on a film in a theater or however, but it's, it's the same, uh, kind of principle. So uh, for results of, so we talked about the worthiness part uh, or un, feeling unworthy. Are the results that you offer your clients through the book, is that a springboard into bigger and more things or just tip them into the right direction? Or, you know, you don't have to really spell, uh, give away the ending or anything like that, but but just uh, have you decided on the how, how that book is are you going to share about your story? I guess that's where I'm kind of leading towards. Yeah, that's that's the difference because I've I've already written an ebook and it's available for free on my website, um, and that's called Alive on Purpose, and it's four keys for men to thrive in life, love, and business. And that's more of a guidance manual um, mm -hmm. and a kind of a almost a coaching script. It's almost like a downloadable. Here, there's four um, keys for you to move through. Um, your uh, barriers so you can come alive on purpose. And that's, um, that's an already written book, but this next book I'm working on is including more of my own journey and my own wounding, my own lostness 
Um, and that's what I've also seen and learned through the men's personal growth spaces and all the different um, organizations that are bringing men together in groups is the power of vulnerability is uh, a superpower. And um, sometimes that can look like just asking for help and saying, I need help, I'm stuck. Because as men, often we're conditioned to not ask for help. <laughs> we're conditioned <laughs> to, to think we can do it all ourselves and we gotta be like the superheroes that were shown that are just you know bulletproof. And right. so part of the paradox of doing healing work is to work both, well, basically starting with the um, acknowledgement that as men, we're all wounded that it's just part of the deal. We have our primal wounds, our primary wounds, and right. uh, tending the wound is, is part of the work. And so that we can paradoxically be broken by life and find that also sweet spot of feeling the unbreakable spirit that keeps us going, that lifts us up when we get, you know, are in the ashes of grief and loss and heartbreak to, to get back on, on the pony and um, rise, you know, that the phoenix, the image of the phoenix coming out of the ash. So there's, there's grief in it and there's um, a certain uh, literacy with grief that is being relearned and, um, and, there, and then the shame shifting. I mean, those are the two major things that, that uh, I think therapists need to master is how to work with grief and shame because those are, are powerful forces that have become kind of clinically, uh, you know, turned into these disorders when really they're just part of the condition of being human. And we need to really get literate with how to um, feel our feelings and uh, do things anyway. Um, so, right. yeah, and my own and um, into life and my own crises. When I was 18, I spent a month in a psych wing and uh, so I know from the inside what it's like to, to be made crazy by our crazy world. Um, at that pivotal time that in my DNA, like as an 18 year old young man, um, it over, somehow it overwhelmed me. It was still, it's still a mystery as to what put me in that condition. And so um, luckily by the, the love of my family and the support, I, I got through it and I, I got back on my path. But that experience marked me for life in, in a way, and it put me on a path of seeking through my 20s. Um, and uh, got, getting so thirsty and so hungry for spirituality that that's when I started to um, find my path um, through medicine ways and, and eventually um, followed some friends that I wanted to support going to a Lakota Sundance. Um, and a long story gets short here, but for nine years I was committed to supporting this Sundance, which included me also doing commitments to vision fast and dance. And one of the transmissions in this uh, kind of, the older male dancers, you know, at the time I was in my late twenties, early thirties, is they just said, see that tree? We dance around a tree. That tree is your purpose. That's all they said, focus on the tree. And so, that's how I really received that um, kind of masculine gift of mentorship of saying, that's your purpose, focus on it, stay with it. And on a, on a somatic level, I took that into my body and, it, and what it did was it sharpened me and it, it made me um, more focused on knowing who I am more specifically and what my gifts are. And that is the mission that I'm on is to deliver the gifts. And that's what I facilitate with my clients is the per process of discovery so they can get to their gifts, know themselves. And then the mission is how do they give their gifts in the world? And that mission is what makes a man unstoppable when he knows, okay, that's what I'm here for. Even if it's not easy, I'm not saying it's easy. It's the hardest thing of all. It's the battle of a lifetime to live your purpose. Um, mm -hmm. But it gets easier. Right. I like that simplicity of, the, of that tree as your purpose. It kind of, um, I think it takes some of the, some of the, uh, sometimes we try to look outside, of, at least that's to speak from my own experience. I look si outside of myself to look at me. And then if I'm not 100% sure of what I'm seeing, I get confused and I, do, I go in different directions. You know, it's like I have different methods of trying to find my purpose 
and then trying to have five purposes all at the same time. It's like, uh, even in simple sort of like Western life, uh, uh, Western civilization life. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, lose some weight. I'm going to stop spending money. I'm going to do, you know, one, you know, one, one after the other, all these things, but I'm going to do them this week, you know? (laughs) And, and, um, it's sort of like, I remember when Lloyd Bridges in, uh, in the airplane, you know, I picked a terrible week to stop sniffing glue or whatever it was. And he kept, kept recurring character in that, in that film. And, and we take, like you were saying about the, uh, the modern world, you know, the things that can uh, bring us, bring us to our knees to uh, quite literally um, if we let them, uh, if we complicate life so much. And I, I really, I, I love that idea of simplicity. And, and I've had that, I've had that same, I, I'm, I completely relate in a different way. Um, I, um, I actually did go to a healer in, uh, in Arizona once and, and experienced just very, very briefly, but, but felt it, uh, but felt it and, 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 and was exposed to it a little bit. And I, I, I wish in part of me wishes that, uh, I would have pursued that, uh, that kind of mentorship relationship, but I did find some other, uh, mentorship around here, uh, closer to home that uh, kept it really simple and say that, you know, the problem, the problem, if we want to call it a problem, isn't necessarily, isn't necessarily me. That's a bad way of thinking about it. It's, it's uh, maybe I'm in the problem, but you know, the way to get out of the problem is to maybe just stop thinking that I am the problem. Uh, mm. You know, it's much more complicated than that, but, uh, but it's actually very, very simple. It's, it's almost like in the, in the sense of, of higher power, um, just so long as it's not me, as long as I know that it's not me, it simplifies everything, you know? So I, that's, that's some pretty, uh, pretty remarkable stuff there, Gabriel, pretty remarkable. So, um, yeah, so, so re, I guess the, uh, is the awareness must be just one of the, the, the keystones to your, uh, re, say if there were, if you had to say like results for your clients, results for people reading your ebook and your new book coming out, is that that uh, awareness of yourself might be is that something that you would say is part of your promise yeah i just the video cut out there i didn't hear the last thing you said but uh, yes yeah, uh, self-awareness just, yeah i mean just sort of like in terms of results it's, it's basically because you it, it's like there's not a you know i can't read a book um and the book isn't alone going to, you know, it's, it's going to suggest uh, certain methods, I presume, but it's not, it's, I think, uh, uh, in terms of the, the promise is awareness, uh, awareness of yourself and the power of yourself. Uh, here I, you know, what I'm trying to do, it's, I'm so interested that I'm trying to figure out what your book says that you haven't, <laughs> haven't put out there yet. So I don't want to get into, I don't want to I don't want to make your book something that it's not. But I just, I just did the experience that I'm having with you is the awareness of my purpose is that tree, very, very simple. So I just, I really, really like that. Um, yeah, and, and purpose is a slippery term, right? And it's a slippery thing because our purpose changes over the lifespan. Like sometimes a purpose will be in our life for a certain time and then it'll complete itself. And then there's an opportunity to start some new purpose. And there isn't a right or a wrong to those cycles. And... Um, the, the thing I'm interested in is the deeper calling, um, and the unlived life of my clients. And right. it's kind of like, I heard you talking, um, this morning, um, on the million dollar story, uh, in, in your morning, uh, transmission. And you, you know, you talked about that, um, that inner calling you, you, you alluded to that too, that they, they have a million dollar story in them and that is their gold. And that's their soul gold. And that's how I look at um, the world too, is I see everybody has a genius potential. And that's the old meaning of genius. Genius or isn't. It's a spirit like a, in the ancient Greeks, they just saw it as like a muse. And it's something you either hear and, and say yes to, like a little small voice from within. Um, Um, cart and buggy of whatever you're pushing down the down the road right now. Um, so I, I'm really interested in in awakening the warriors um, that uh, are there to protect the soul house, so to speak, of of every man. And with the like, 
image that comes to mind is Robert Bly has an image of modern men um, that is kind of pretty cynical. <laughs> and uh, he says that his image of the inner life of modern men is a litter of dead soldiers surrounding their fallen king. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> And, and that kind of goes along with the thesis of uh, the high rates of concealed depression in men, is that mm. many men will put on the superhero armor of like, yeah, I'm gonna get through this day and I'm gonna put on a smile and deal, you know, get through it. But maybe there's some incredibly powerful gift that isn't being given if they just get, you know, stick with business as usual. What I'm interested in is the unlived life that is a, a, a piece of their soul gold that if they bring it into the world, it makes the world so much richer and it creates the freedom and purpose alignment that's gonna make their life better too. So right. those are the kind of outcomes. I mean, purpose is also a slippery word because in personal growth and new age uh, spaces, people will say, oh yeah, find your purpose here, you know, put a price tag on it and I'll help you find your purpose. Right. And, and you know, it's a little like that, you know, and, but. I also see it a different way. It's like once I figure out my purpose, it doesn't make life easier. Sometimes finding purpose is like, oh, really? Oh, that's what I got to do? Like it, it sometimes also work. And um, at the end of the day, you are your purpose. Right. At the end of the day, it's something to do with just who you are. When you're being most truly yourself, when you are just naturally accepting your gifts into the world, um, and your your way of being. A lot of um, my early work at, has been as an art therapist, and I, because I have a particular uh, interest in creativity, I got trained as an art therapist, and I, I worked with a lot of clients making art in session, and um, a lot of children too. I worked in schools as an art therapist. And could you could you, ex could you explain real quick to someone who may not know what an art therapist? You know, tell us sure. what an art therapist is. So an art therapist will use art making or um, making things um, in the session to work on a symbolic level and move energy through the moving of the hands and the image, which the soul thinks in images. So it's like draw a picture or, or just scribble and play with color. Like it doesn't have to have meaning. Just to move energy and then bring that playfulness into the therapeutic space, into the relationship. And it's right. used a lot with children, like troubled children, because mm -hmm. it's also the natural language of childhood, play. Right. Right. Um, so, but what I notice with so many adults is a block. And a, oh, I can't make art because I've been told since I was in grade two that my picture was no good or, or whatever. There's a, there's a shrinking, there's a, oh, I can't sing because I didn't go to that single. So, but when we're six, you know, we make a mess, we make a picture, we sing a song, we dance around and right. we're, we're free. And that's part of that sort of societal shaming of those innate gifts of creativity that just wants to move in our natural human being. So, right. so my interest is in, in the creativity. That's part of the unlocking of the genius and the purpose. And then also bringing that into a business strategy of going, okay, well, how do I then and there bring this gold into the world and thrive with it, right. um, which is another task unto itself. Um, and the artist brings their artwork to a museum in, this, in the city and the, the museum says, oh, that's very nice artwork, but um, right now people are buying pictures of flowers. Can you paint flowers? Right. And the artist has a choice. Well, they can either go paint flowers and bring them back to the museum to sell paintings, or they can say, no way, that's not what I do. That's not my art. And they can go back to their, their studio and just keep making their art. Right. And um, so the, the dilemma sets it up that, oh, well, maybe the, maybe the world doesn't have space for my gifts. Maybe there's no place for my creativity, but there's also a third thing. And the third thing is, is well, you can do what the market asks of you, or you can do what your soul is asking for. But the third thing is actually doing both, is doing what you're here to do and then having the faith. And that's that higher power thing that, that you'll be guided. And the hardest thing to do is to find a place for that gift, but it's out there. And that's right. another part of the coaching work I do is to 
break through all the self-limiting belief systems or the, the self-doubt that many of us have been encoded with and, and just release that and, and then rinse and repeat and keep, keep coming back to that. Well, I, I completely agree. I couldn't, you know, the, the idea that the, um, there's so much more support than I ever thought there would be out there for now. What is he doing? He's like, this guy's cr he's crazy. What is he doing now? <laughs> and it's always been like that. You know, you take a risk, you know, unfortunately it feels like such a risk, but because uh, I think we touched on that last week. It's uh, a lot of people have unfinished projects in their life because they're afraid of the rejection. They're yeah. afraid of, of, of the, like you say, the work, you know, sometimes if we have a calling, uh, you know, if it becomes almost a responsibility to impact the world, you know, it doesn't just flip, you know, it's like, hey, if I decided, hey, I'm going to be a virtuoso guitar player, you know, I'm like, it's going to go pick up the guitar and, and, and start playing. I have to I gotta lock down and practice. I have to practice and then I have to share it with the world. And that is the whole uh, anxiety factor that comes into play. I have a, built a career on anxiety, basically, uh, you know, this idea of me being on a on a show hosting a guest is something that even just even just six five six years ago would have been like impossible impossible but you know my storytelling uh career became out of necessity I, I decided it was much better to tell other people's stories than it was to tell my stories i'm i'm like i i hid behind the camera i got very very good at it because i could see it my my acuity level of of understanding people's story was pretty high and um, but that was very convenient for me because the more I told other people's stories, the more I didn't have to tell mine. <laughs> and and so it it was uh, I told I completely get what you're talking about. But that was my calling. It was my calling to help other people in that sense. And then uh, sometimes, uh, like I think you're doing a little bit of in your in your new book is you know, I have to share a little bit about how, how tough it was to drag myself up when I was down. How tough it was to come into work today. I mean, you don't have those old feelings of anxiety this morning. It's like, well, what would happen if I, what would happen? You know, I'm thinking subconsciously, maybe I'll lock myself out by accident of my office and then I won't have to do the live interview with Gabriel. <laughs> I mean, those things do still pop into my mind, but um, I don't yeah. act on them. Any, I don't act on them anymore, which is because those are just like playing games. And, you know, my purpose today was simple turn, you know, go live. I did all the research I had to do this weekend to make sure that all things technically worked. Uh, if you see a very simple looking uh, uh, point of view from this camera angle, but if you saw the other side of it, you know, I've got lights all over the place. I just have all this stuff just to make, just to make sure that things were, were just right. But then the actual act of sitting down and having a conversation is, is something that still scares me a little bit, but that's just because I'm worried about what people are thinking. Um, but uh, enough about me. I just say, I, I'm just letting you, I, I'm just sharing with you that sometimes the simplest things, uh, uh, like you said, asking for help. The only reason I'm on here with you today is because along the way I did ask for help and I was honest with somebody. I didn't tell them I knew everything about everything because I did play the Iron Man for so long in my businesses because you know, you've got kids, I've got kids, but then when you have uh, other people that work for you, your team members, those are also kids, it, kind of kids, uh, because if they're mouths to feed. And if we're in the, the sort of traditional, uh, I had the Midwestern upbringing where the man provided no matter what. And uh, so that's a tough thing to, you know, to take, to take a risk uh, and, and put yourself out there, like you say, like singing, you know, how do I say, you know, how, how do I do on camera? How do I do things that are uncomfortable? Um, but it's still maybe your calling because that message that you have to share with people and how you're leading people into the light, if you want to call it something simple, is, is pretty remarkable. Congratulations, yeah, and, Gabriel. Yeah, and thanks, Keith. And I think this is a really something that this whole interview is something we're sharing, right? Because you're we're we're creating to share, you know, about about the the pattern of hiding. Um, because I've I can relate with that too, of wanting to hide behind my therapy office because in here it's private. Mm -hmm. Gabriel, go back just a second because uh, you froze just Orient a second. Sure. If you could, just a second about about the hiding part. 
the, about the interview being part of it, it's kind of locked up a little bit. We'll maybe just pick up that line a little bit. Oh, did it? The fro it froze. Yeah, yeah. Your side froze. Just it's just a minute, just for a second. You're good now. Oh, I'm good. Um, so we're talking about hiding, and and hiding is um, a, a strategy. It's a survival strategy that works for so long. And we can get really good at hiding behind different roles. Like, oh, okay, this is my role. I'm going to wear this hat, and this is this is where I stop. You know. But right. then there's always something, something maybe inside that's gaining in pro this morning that wanted to just get out. And a, a way that I like to language it is that little voice that says, "Oh, maybe you should keep hiding." Um, is uh, we what we could call it a predator. Um, and they, this comes from the work of Clarissa Pinkola Estes, as well as Francis Weller, who are two of my favorite um, psychotherapists. And they talk about the predator in terms of the inner battle. And the predator is there to uh, keep us hidden, keep us safe, and scare us uh, out of our um, expansion. Because the predator feeds on the unclaimed parts of us. Uh, the parts of us that we are, are ex essentially in exile, which maybe that's our greatness. And sometimes that could look like everybody's familiar with the idea of the shadow. And, um, you know, maybe there's something in someone else that I don't like that triggers me. Um, well, there's another expression of shadow called the golden shadow. And that's when I put all of the gold that I can conceive of onto other people's greatness. I think, oh, that person's great, or that, I'm just gonna keep amplifying the greatness and the gold of others and polishing it and shining it. And it's an unwillingness to actually drop in and down and go, okay, where's what's golden about me? Which is a, not an easy thing to claim because we've been taught not to shine. Right. So, you know, even your um, moment this morning of of wrestling with that predator shows you're you've you've conquered that predator to that degree that you're you know and it doesn't go away and I'll tell you a secret all, pretty much all therapists and counselors also get nervous before the session it's not just when you're going to therapists you're like right the therapist also gets nervous because they're they don't know either it's all right. unknown it's facing the unknown and it's the fear of being seen, such elemental fears, the fear of being heard, the fear of ridicule. Um, sometimes it's the fear of success and, and that leads to a self-sabotage. And so that's sure. another big medicine to transforming self-sabotage mm -hmm. um, that I work with my clients on. I went to, this is just a, I have to have some levity in my life, otherwise it'd be too serious. <laughs> but I literally, this is a, is a true story, is I, I went to a, um, uh, therapy session uh, years ago and it was I was we were just continuing on a, a little bit of an abandonment issue and um, her name was Louise bless her heart uh, she she didn't come to the session <laughs> my therapist oh. didn't come to the session oh. about, about my abandonment and she showed up for her next session and I just stayed in the hallway and I was like I don't know I you know I was a full-on adult in my 30s and uh, it wasn't like I was but I felt like I was about eight years old and, and it was, I mean, we had to laugh and she, she was so sweet about it, but it was just the, of course. And then I thought I had the, you know, like the black mark on me. It's like, I, I schedule a session about abandonment and my therapist doesn't show up. <laughs> wow. But I, that was, uh, we, it, it was just a little humor. Uh, but, but that was a true story. I, 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 I didn't, I didn't crumble after that, so I was I was okay. <laughs> but you that's, know, that, that's it, it, good it, that you can laugh at that. Yeah, yeah. So, but but the idea, I think, I really do think you touched on such a huge thing with men, you know. And I think that um, even if you look at the at the million dollar story ninja group, which I encourage everybody to join, of course, um, is that you know there's there's a lot fewer men in there for the. I believe that part of it is the sh sheer um apprehension for men to ask for help you know I, i've certainly worked with plenty of men uh but it's they're not usually the first guys in line to say hey i'd like to try something about try to try to you know let's talk about how i can be a little more vulnerable because i know 
in my heart that that's going to help me uh, even in my business, show a little bit of connection, you know, show a little bit of, of uh, you know, it's like, who's going to be the first one? Who's going to be the first one to share uh, a story that's going to be um, revealing? Uh, and a lot of times it's not going to be a man. Um, but if it is, I mean, I'm just saying that that's, sometimes you get a, men together and they will, they're just, nobody will raise their hand. So asking for help is just a huge huge thing that we can do is that I think part of it is showing by example that we do ask for help. You know, I've got coaching uh, in my background and in my current uh, strategy right now, it's, it's just, it's imperative. Um, it takes a while to realize that to take sometimes a lifetime to realize, or sometimes it takes a lifetime and never, never have gotten that opportunity. Yeah. So, you know, and, that's all. Oh, go ahead. Oh, and there's something about coaching that, um, uh, is different than the therapy room because the therapy room, there's no commitment to major transformation in therapy. We go and we dip our finger in the water and we feel a little bit soothed because we're tending our wounds, but to step into a, a contract with a coach is to make a bigger commitment to your own transformation and self-realization and for many years, I didn't really look at the coaching world. I thought, oh, what is this all about? Because I was busy doing therapy work. And I actually had a lot of judgments about coaching, um, that it maybe was shallow or flashy or that wasn't. But then I started to kind of have some ahas when I invested in my own growth by getting mm -hmm. some coaches and getting the support and showing up completely helpless. Like, I don't know what to do about this or how do I do that? And then being given the tools and um, having those relationship, those mentorship relationships with someone who could pull me up to another level. Um, and yeah, and are afraid yeah, to ask for help. And it's because of that fear of vulnerability of the fear of, of looking stupid or looking like I don't know. And, and um, that's part of the mix. Yeah, it's part of the medicine. Right. Well, I do think that, um, you know, talking about the, my original exposure to coaching was, um, uh, the expectations. I had expectations. Uh, I wasn't necessarily asking for help. I was after, I was looking for someone to come and rescue me, someone mm -hmm. to come in and do it for me, basically, because they're charging enough money. It's some people, some some systems and programs that it's like, if I'm going to throw down this kind of money, I expect this to be done for me. Because if I, sp if I spent this much money in my regular <laughs> world, I would get something solid in, in return. So, and, yeah. and, and uh, so I will completely at this point, um, I will take responsibility for that because I had different sets of expectations and I had, um, you know, and those types of like in uh, inaccurate type of expectations, all they did was lead to resentments. And however, I was blessed with the breakthrough to look at myself in that, in those regards to say, no, this is a two-way uh, agreement, and there isn't a coach that's going to make this thing happen. But they're going to leave lead, lead you down some roads that will let you do it. Because if you, I mean, in in my uh, story programs that I teach, uh, you know, it's all business too. It's like it's not just about feeling great about, uh, uh, you know, and that that's not the end of of the program, the end of the uh, system. It's it's about taking and doing something with it. So. Uh, in that moment that I always call the light bulb moment at moment is when you own it, you own this stuff, you own your own story, and then you can believe you can do anything you want with it. So Gabriel, I, I, I want to appreciate, I want to give you enough time to, and what we can do is, uh, you know, we'll share our links around for this video. And I want you to put in, um, uh, every, every last detail about getting your book, uh, pre-sold and, and so why don't you tell us about it? And we'll also back that up with our, uh, tags. Okay, um, well, uh, if you wanna support my mission, which is also about um, a nonprofit that I founded called Sacred Pathways Foundation uh, with a mission of restoring initiations and rites of passage for men and male youth. Um, the link is through an agent called Publishizer and they're a crowdfunding agent um, who crowdfunds the um, authoring of books uh, to get them to the next level towards publishing. So. If you go on the Google Publishizer, um, and then you can
collection, which is called The Wholehearted Man, Alive on Purpose. And uh, pre-order a copy. You could pre-order a couple copies, um, and there'll be more incentives. And you'll get um, a, uh, book, a copy of the book with a, um, a personalized note from, from me and my sons. And also, uh, you'll get uh, your name mentioned in the book by pre-ordering the, the, the copy. And, and another thing about the book I wanted to say is that it's also a love letter to my own sons and the men of tomorrow to share some of my own wounding, some of my own struggles and fears. You know, gift to the men of tomorrow too, to really step into their purpose because our, our world needs purpose-driven leadership and, and men need a boost to that because sometimes you gotta go in and down before you can rise up. I completely agree. Um, yeah, and, and you know, just I think the emphasis is is the coming up, but it's hard to come up if you you know that experience is transformational because you know we get a chance to help the people that are down there and can't get out. You know, I think so. Well, I want to thank you once again, Gabriel. It was an awesome, awesome talk. Um, and keep me posted. We'll we'll we're in the same circle, so anything I can do to help, um, and we'll like I say, we'll shop this. Uh, pop this video around and make sure that everybody who needs to see it can see it. It's kind of timeless. It's not urgent, but we want to get those books uh, pre-sold. Um, and then, uh, you know, like I say, you, I'll, I'll share them on your timeline and you can, you can spice up the uh, anything you want to send it back to me. We can talk about that after our, sh our uh, broadcast here, but uh, Gabriel, uh, tell me how to, I'm going to uh, Kazan. Kazan. Kazan, you know, I tried to, I, I knew that. I, I'm so sorry. Gabriel Just like Kazan. Shazam, like the Shazam. superhero. Shazam, Kazan. Okay. Kazan, Gabriel Kazan. Um, uh, the Wholehearted Man, Alive on Purpose uh, project. He's got a book that he's uh, pre-selling right now, and he just gave us the details, and we'll put those details in. Um, my name is Keith Salmon, and this is the Million Dollar Story series where we have guys and Ladies, just like Gabriel, with transformational stories of inspiration, you know, Gabriel truly has a million dollar story and he's doing something with it. It's a two, two part epiphany, as I spoke about this morning. It's like you be realizing that you have that million dollar story and then kind of the how, how to share it with the world and make an impact on the world the, the way you want. I want to wish everybody a safe week this week. If you're experiencing any of the fires in the West Coast, um, and I'm in Los Angeles. Gabriel's up in, uh, is it British Columbia? Yeah. And, and the smoke has just come up there. And I was saying before that my son is up in uh, the Portland, Oregon area. And um, it's, it's pretty bad out there. The, the air quality is not good. Hopefully they'll get a good handle on things coming up soon. So Gabriel, thank you once again. And um, if you get a chance, I want you to, to check out the Million Dollar Story Ninja group where we develop our stories. I help you find your story if you haven't found it yet. If you've found it, we help, uh, uh, I, I teach how to make that impact on the world the way that you want to make an impact in the world and, and take it into your business and your business um, vision. So thank you once again, and we will see you on the next episode. Okay, so I'm gonna just take, take us out of this room here. And Gabriel, thanks once again. We'll see you real yeah. soon. Bye. Thanks, Heath. Bye.